<clears throat> community ecology is the, uh, the study of the interactions between the different organisms. <clears throat> and we can look at it in a number of different ways. Um, we can consider coevolution, in which two organisms or a group of organisms are <clears throat> moving through time together and interacting with each other and changing. Um, this can lead to the production of secondary compounds, proteins, things that will show up in the organism's uh, body in one way or another. <clears throat> this can lead to camouflage, in other words, the variations that might lead to coloration that uh, made an organism disappear into the background um, would be useful. Um, sometimes these colorations are just the opposite. They are uh, very bright and loud. Um, the organism stands out from the background. Poison arrow frogs are an example of this, and this is uh, aposomatic uh, coloration in which the organism is advertising that it's unpalatable. The monarch butterfly does this in its coloration. Uh, it's advertising that if you uh, if you do eat, eat uh, this particular butterfly, you're going to probably get sick. Um, mimicry is a way that organisms will um, take advantage of that coloration in one way or another. Um, one type of mimicry, Batesian mimicry, uh, one organism is in fact dangerous um, and it warns uh, others of that. Um, one example would be the green uh, parrot snake. It is a it's a it's a dangerous organism. Um, however, um, the hawk moth uh, larva has uh, coloration on its body that makes it look like the head of a green parrot snake, and therefore um, it derives some benefit from that relationship. Uh, in Mullerian mimicry. Um, you have two organisms that both have converged on the same pattern of color that uh, is advertising that they are dangerous. Um, and your wasps, your yellow jacket wasp and your cuckoo bee both have that same coloration and they both could sting you. We can look at interspecific competition and this is competition between two species and we can see that um, when, whenever we have competition it's usually a negative thing for both. Uh, and if they're competing for everything, for food, shelter, water, everything that they would uh, possibly need in the environment to survive, um, we would call this their niche. All the, the niche is everything that they have to have in order to survive. And if everything in their niche completely overlaps between two competing species, one of them would be eliminated. And that's what's known as the competitive exclusion principle, or sometimes as Gauss's uh, principle of competitive exclusion uh, and it states that no two species can occupy the same niche indefinitely. Now the idea of niche can be looked at a couple different ways. There's a, there's a fundamental niche and there's a theoretical niche. A theoretical niche is what an organism could potentially occupy in the environment if there was no competition. Um, the realized niche or fundamental niche uh, is what that organism actually does occupy. In other words, the amount of the environment that they can take advantage of because there is competition there. There are a number of classic studies that have looked at barnacles, that have looked at paramecia, uh, that have actually demonstrated uh, that this principle actually does play out in nature. Um, one of the things that we can see is resource partitioning, and resource partitioning in the environment has to do with that competition. And because their niches can't overlap, one would be eliminated. What's happened is you find that uh, organisms will have something that's different, and so feeding uh, location is a commonly uh, studied one where we have uh, some songbirds that feed at different levels in the trees. And by doing that, um, they're not competing for everything in that same environment. And what you're, you're kind of looking at when you look at this type of resource partitioning, in other words, they're dividing up the resource, is you're looking at uh, the ghost of competition past. In other words, at one point in time these were competing, but at, at this point in time they have uh, worked out a way that they both can exist in the environment and not have their niches completely overlap.
This also can lead to um, character displacement. And character displacement is when some uh, aspect of the organism changes when they're in uh, competition with each other so that, again, they can exploit different uh, parts of that environment. And the classic case is the beak of uh, some birds. Um, Darwin's finches are one example where because they're living in close contact with each other, if one has variation in their beak that allows them to take advantage of larger seeds and another has variation within their beak that allows them to take advantage of catching smaller insects, then they're no longer competing uh, completely with each other. In other words, um, there's some variation within their niches so they don't uh, eliminate each other. And this uh, is called character displacement. We can also look at a whole range of uh, different interactions like uh, predation, mutualism, commensalism, and different types of parasitism um, or parasites. <clears throat> and so if we, if we look at these, we can kind of put them into some type of uh, ordered form that allows us to see whether these interactions benefit both or not. And so um, these types of interspecific uh, interactions, we can look at competition and competition is not going to benefit either because that means that neither of them are going to get as much as they want of whatever it is, whatever the resource is. And you could look at brown bears and black bears on the, the Salmon River. Um, obviously, if the, the brown bear had it all to themselves, they would get more, but the black bears sneak in there and so they get some of the salmon too. The black bears would like to get more salmon, but the brown bears are bigger and kind of keep them, you know, in other locations on the river. Uh, but nonetheless, there's competition there. Uh, humans and rats are competing with each other. They, they get into our food supplies. Um, we try to eliminate them. We can't. Uh, they continue to get into our food supplies. We're, we're competing for the same resource. Um, there are different types of symbiosis, and symbiosis um, can include mutualism, commensalism, and sometimes uh, parasitism is even included there. And what we see with uh, mutualism is both organisms would benefit, so it's a plus-plus for both organisms. And examples of this could be uh, something like uh, human being and uh, dog. When human uh, first started its association with dog, dog was able to, <clears throat> you know, help it, help human with hunting, help protect human. In exchange, dog received food and protection from humans. So I mean, it's a, a mutualistic relationship. Um, we can we can see these things um, in ants and the acacia trees in Africa, where the ants live inside the acacia tree. They have shelter. Uh, they take advantage of the nectaries on the acacia tree. But if a herbivore tries to graze on that tree, then the ants will boil out and attack the herbivore. So the tree gets some protection from um, providing nectar and housing for the ant, so it's a mutualistic uh, relationship. Commensalism, one organism benefits, the other seem, doesn't seem to be hurt, doesn't seem to be helped. Uh, one commonly uh, represented example of this is where barnacles will grow on a whale or a sea turtle, and the barnacle derives some benefit of this because it gets to move through the water column, uh, it gets food source, it has a substrate uh, to attach to, being the whale body or the turtle body, uh, the whale or the turtle doesn't gain anything from this relationship, it's thought, so um, it's a commensal relationship. Uh, herbivory is a type of interaction that takes place, and herbivory is, uh, you know, a herbivore, a grazing animal. This could be insect, this could be cow, this could be deer, uh, could be zebra, wh whatever the herbivore is. Uh, is grazing on whichever plants that uh, that uh, herbivore desires and obviously it's not good for the plant. The plant is going to suffer, uh, possibly lose completely, uh, but the herbivore gains something from this. Um, predation, uh, predators use claws, they use teeth, <clears throat> they have special senses that allow them to detect prey, they have better eyesight, binocular vision, and um, Predator obviously derives benefit from uh, this because that's how they obtain the nutrients they need. The prey species doesn't really derive anything from this. Um, snake and frog, lion and zebra, human and cow. Um, parasites. Uh, par parasites can come in a couple of different forms. We can have parasites on the outside of the body. We can have parasites on the inside of the body. So 
ecto or endoparasites. And then we can also have uh, parasites that uh, are, are very specialized. They lay their larva on organisms and their larva will bore into them and some parasitic wasps are like that. Um, tapeworms are internal parasites, ticks are external parasites. Now, um, it, it's thought that some types of uh, coevolution, if not most types of coevolution, are driven by different types of relationships and not just uh, predation, not just the lion chasing the gazelle and making the gazelle faster, but also the mutualistic relationships between the ants and the acacia trees and uh, the benefit that the plants derive from uh, providing nectaries and pollen to the insects that pollinate them. So there are a number of different uh, types of adaptations that are beneficial to an organism um, in these relationships. And so this helps feed these relationships. And there are so many different types of relationships on this planet that we know hardly anything about, uh, particularly when we start to get to the microorganisms, but they're all extremely important. Um, they're all connected to each other in some way. Now, sometimes we can look at um, community ecology and, and look at uh, what happens <clears throat> when communities are disturbed. And there are a couple classic types of disturbance we can look at. It's called um, primary and secondary succession. And in primary succession, all soil is wiped away. Um, you could look at examples of new volcanic uh, flows, so we're lava has created new landscape, there's no soil there. And in order for that soil to get established, you have to have a certain amount of time. Uh, you have to have dispersal from organisms um, from some nearby area. And eventually, uh, you'll get mosses and lichens forming on these uh, substrate on the bare lava rock or the <clears throat> new rock, the moraine that's been uh, exposed by the retreating glacier. And eventually uh, this will lead to a little bit of a soil bed where seeds can get established and then you'll get some herbaceous plants growing. And eventually these herbaceous plants, their bodies uh, will die and it'll start to accumulate. And you may get a seed bed now, a soil bed that's deep enough, enough organic matter that a tree seedling can get established. And the tree's roots will help break up the rock um, Eventually, this leads to uh, what ecologists used to refer to as a climax community. In other words, a, a community that would always be going in a particular direction. Um, another way to look at this is secondary succession. And secondary succession means that you already had uh, soil uh, here. However, something set it back. And so this could have been a hurricane. It could be a fire. It could be a flood. It could be human beings coming in and clearing the area. It could be the elephants going through the forest and changing the, the architecture of the forest. <clears throat> and then once this disturbance has gone through, uh, you would see again some progression of the community, the plant community going back to some climax community. So if we look at the classic case of the abandoned farm field, um, first you would have herbaceous weeds in that field and then you would have some trees that could uh, tolerate a great deal of sun, um, very little shading uh, would be tolerated by these trees. So you would see pine trees maybe moving into this field. Um, eventually the pine trees would get large enough, they would provide some shade and you might have some understory trees uh, come in and these might be some hardwood trees and then eventually after a hundred years you end up with some type of hardwood forest. And again, this would have been the climax community or the model that would predict that there would be one climax that would come from any uh, succession of uh, change that would take place in a particular uh, place in the landscape. However, um, that model is not completely played out in nature. We see that um, there's some other models that seem to work out a little bit better, and one is called the non-equilibrium model. And in this, we have a polyclimax. In other words, um, you have all these different types of communities that might be present, and they're all there at the same time. They're just in different stages. They might be in the seed bank in the soil. 
Um, they may be patches that are uh, located within that larger uh, community type, and they're all in different stages. So all the different communities are present. Uh, they're just in different stages of development uh, in that large spatial area. Um, another idea is the intermediate disturbance hypothesis. And this states that you need to have a certain amount of disturbance within communities in order for them to survive. Um, one good example to look at is uh, fire. Uh, naturally occurring fires play a role in maintaining many, many different types of ecosystems. In the southeastern United States, you have pine forests which are adapted to um, periodic fires. And these fire return intervals can be as short as every couple years to every 10, 15, 20 years. And if you don't have fire in these particular types of communities, uh, what will happen is it'll start to lose its biodiversity. In other words, there won't be enough variation within the habitat. There won't be exposed mineral soil. There won't be sunny places. Uh, that you start to lose diversity within these things. And so having a certain amount of disturbance within a community is a useful way to maintain that community. And in fact, if you don't have that disturbance, the community may very well um, disappear and all the biodiversity that's associated with it. Community ecology is uh, very complicated. There's many, many types of interactions that take place and many, many of them we don't uh, understand very well. 